Hello everyone. So it is 12 o'clock. We'll um, get started with the webinar today. So um, we're very fortunate today to have Melissa uh, Elhus and Barbara Oak from Northern Health to talk to us about um, Paradox of Wealth and Health, Resource Development and Social Determinants of Health. Just some housekeeping items before we start. If you are joining as a group and would like to receive sci-fi educational credits, uh, please email me. I will put my email address in the chat box um, to let me know who joined with you and their email addresses so I can mark you as all um, present. So um, just a brief overview of uh, Barb and uh, Melissa. So Barb is a regional manager of health and resource development in Northern Health. Barb Oak is a natural resources management professional with a BSc in environmental science and physical geography. Over 15 years experience working in areas where industrial activities intersect with the environmental and health outcomes. Mrs. Oak has worked for public health at Northern Health in Northern British Columbia since 2009, where she initially managed the air quality program before leading the development of the Office of Health and Resource Development in 2014. The Office of Health and Resource Development is a unique body within the Health Authority that focuses on better understanding, managing, and addressing the wide array of health impacts associated with major industrial projects. In her role as the Regional Manager for Health and Resource Development, Barb Oak is continuously striving to increase the understanding and improve the practice of how health can be better incorporated into major project decisions. And Melissa is a Health and Resource Development Technical Advisor in Northern Health. Melissa has experience working in a variety of research and public health capacities and joined Northern Health's Office of Health and Resource Development in 2015. Since then, she has participated in numerous environmental assessment processes across industry sectors, contributed to reviews of policy and legislation, supported research, and co-authored several best practice guidelines. She was the lead author of a summary report prepared for in collaboration with the BC Observatory for Population and Public Health on impacts of resource development to social determinants of health. Ms. Elhus is also the regional coordinator for the Northern BC branch of the Environmental uh, Environment Community Health Observatory Network. She received her BSc in Health Sciences from Simon Fraser University as a fourth generation resident of Fort St. John, BC a community hosting significant industrial development. She has a unique insight into the challenges a community faces in adapting to changes brought on by resource development. So just a reminder for everyone on the phone, please keep your phones on mute during the presentation and during the question and answer period, uh, please put your answers into the chat box and we'll answer them accordingly. Thank you, Barb and Melissa. Thanks, Tina, for this great introduction, and um, thanks everybody who's joining us here today uh, to talk about a topic that I know Melissa and I are very passionate about, which is the health impacts of resource development. And even though this is um, being hosted by the National Collaborating Center of Environmental Health, we're actually going to be not talking about the environmental health impact, but instead talking about impacts beyond environmental health, looking at the social health impact and impacts on the social, cultural, and economic determinants of health. I know that, um, oh, see my slides are gonna advance. Okay. Um, I know Tina already gave an introduction to us, but just so everybody knows who the voice is that's talking to them, can kind of uh, attach it to a picture. Um, it's uh, just a picture of Melissa and my, myself. So speaking is Barb Oak, I'm the regional manager. Hi everyone, this is Melissa Alhus as well. So thanks for joining. And so today uh, we're going to be co-presenting. Uh, I'm going to start off the present presentation by talking a little bit about uh, Northern Health and the, our context and what why we've been working in this area. And then Melissa is going to be sharing um, some learnings and findings on two specific projects that we've been working on um, that really summarizes the uh, social health impact of resource development and as well as some leading and promising practices for the assessment and monitoring of these. And then it's the bike's going to come back to me and I'll just talk a little bit about how we've been using this information and, and the learnings in our practice and some of the successes, challenges that, that we've encountered and kind of where we go from here. So to start with, uh, 
for anybody that's not familiar with Northern Health, I just wanted to provide some a little bit of background of our context. So we are a health authority that covers the northern half of the province of British Columbia. Uh, we are a very large health authority when it comes to the amount of um, land area that we cover. We cover over 600 square kilometers. But we're actually a very small health authority when you look at how many people that we service. So we service about 300,000 people across this big area. And when you look at the number of beds that Northern Health has, for instance, in, in hospitals, uh, you add them all together, they would equate to about one larger urban hospital. So very much a region that's characterized by small service centers. We very much consider ourselves a, a rural health authority. And we also have a fairly large Indigenous population and many uh, small um, Indigenous communities and, and also small non-Indigenous communities that are um, located throughout the region. So the other thing that characterizes our region is that uh, we cover a very resource-rich area. We have a lot of forestry in our region, a lot of um, mining, both mineral and coal. We have hydroelectric developments. We have um, oil and gas. And so if you, when you look at where communities in the Northern Health region are located and compare that to where major projects have been proposed, for instance, uh, uh, those that have entered the environmental assessment process on the right-hand side of the picture, and you can compare that, you can see there's a, there's a lot of overlap. And the same is true when you look at the bottom map, which shows um, industrial land use changes over time. Uh, our communities, or the communities within Northern Health are very much um, uh, resource dependent. They're very reliant on the resource sector, um, very much shaped and influenced by the various resource uh, activities in, in the region. And, and many of them exist because of the resources um, that, that were developed in, in, in the area. And it follows that the health in, in these communities is also very much influenced by resource development activities. Uh, the other thing that characterizes our region, unfortunately, is that when we're compared to our more southern or urban counterparts, we do lag behind when it comes to health outcomes and our health status. Um, in a recent, recent report published by the Provincial Health Officer, uh, it was recognized that it's disproportionate and inequitable burden of disease, illness, injury, and mortality is experienced in rural areas of British Columbia, and we, this very much resonates with us. Uh, when you compare things, for instance, like life expectancy across the province, um, you can see the Northern Health HSDAs are the bottom three. So we, you know, people in our region are, don't live as long. Um, they're, they're experiencing worse health outcomes than com when comparing to more Southern and urban areas. Um, one thing that's interesting is when we actually compare our health status with other Northern and rural areas across Canada, there's actually a lot of similarities. And so this is a phenomenon that's not unique to British Columbia. It's a phenomenon that, that is experienced across Canada and, and, and in other places of the world where these resource rich rural hinterlands really are experiencing um, poorer outcomes when it comes to health. In 2014, um, there was a huge amount of projects that were being proposed in the Northern Health region. Many of them were related to the LNG industry. That was um, a lot of the projects were seeking their environmental assessment certificate and entering into the environmental assessment process. Um, but also a lot of uh, mineral mines, coal mines, major hydroelectric development. And Northern Health was getting questions, requests, inquiries, um, requests for meetings um, across the board from um, concerned citizens, community representatives, industries, um, you know, consultants. Um, agencies that were all wanting to get a better understanding of how, how does health fit into this? What are, what are the health impacts associated with these projects? What's Northern Health doing about them? And so in 2014, there was a decision made at Northern Health to dedicate a small amount of resources to look at this more um, intently, intensely and, and try to get a bit of coordination around our responses and, and what we understand about resource development interactions with health and where we need to see and participate in the conversations we need to be part of and the processes we should engage in to try to um, protect and promote health and ensure that health is being considered in these project decisions. And so that was when the Office of Health and Resource Development was established. It's a very small office. It's um, myself and then there's two technical advisors. Um, Melissa is one of them. 
Um, so there's the three of us that, that worked in this area. And so we've been looking at this uh, area of our health and resource development interact. I actually have an environmental science background. I come from environmental health, uh, um, looking at air quality. Um, so, but, but early on when we started this office, we made a decision that we wanted to look at this issue beyond just environmental health. Um, and this was really based on, well, my slides are not advancing. Oh, sorry. This was really based on um, what uh, we know about health and how health is defined, um, you know, how First Nations um, consider health and wellness really very holistically um, at, at the outer circle, um, environmental, social, economic, and cultural wellness. What we know about how uh, important the social economic determinants are in defining health outcomes, that more than health out, half of the health outcomes are really defined by our, our life and these social, economic, and cultural environments in which we live. And also the importance of health equity when it comes to um, the, the health of the, um, you know, defining the health of the population. So using the, this, this evidence um, that, that there's a large body of evidence to, to support these principles, using these, this is how we approach the topic of the resource development and um, started participating in, in various aspects uh, of, uh, of our work. Um, and this very much aligned with what we are hearing at the community level as well. So th this is just a very small snippet of the um, newspaper articles and, and headlines that we often see across the Northern Health region. And in, when you look at that, I mean, it, it is somewhat reflective of what is of concern to community members. And when you, you look at that, of course, things like air emissions or spills are very important and the environmental health piece is very important. But uh, it, it goes much beyond that. So it, it considers things like affordable housing or um, and school enrollment, um, uh, job losses, uh, employment, violence, poverty, homelessness, gendered impact, food security. It really captures it all. So that's really how we've been approaching this work. Um, when we started doing that, um, we, we got a lot of questions, especially we do a lot of work uh, on, on, at the project level um, supporting the environmental assessment process. And at the time when we started doing that work, the health sections of the environmental assessments really were focused mostly on environmental health. They were really focused on air quality, water quality, comparing those to objectives, and sometimes human health risk assessments. But health, uh, the broader concept of health was it was not really looked in that way. And so it prompted a lot of questions. I think we caught a lot of people off guard, uh, proponents and their consultants and, and people working in, under the process within the agencies had a lot of questions for us around, you know, okay, so you're saying it's more than environmental health, but what, what impact are you talking about? What evidence is that based on? You know, why does health care about things like housing and poverty? Why are you reviewing the social sections or the economic sections? And, and there was, it really wasn't a good understanding of how important those socioeconomic and cultural determinants of health were on determining health out outcomes. But even um, proponents or consultants or, or other representatives that uh, understood that the importance of looking at health more holistically had a lot of questions for us around, well, how do we do that? You know, what are the leading practices and protocols that we should be following in BC? What indicators should we be using? What data sources should we be using? How do we collect data? And to be honest, um, even though we, we knew what we saw in environmental assessment wasn't, um, you know, sometimes wasn't great and, and we thought it could be done better, we didn't have a lot of those answers to those, these more very um, practical questions. And so we went on a little bit of a fact-finding mission, I would say, and started partnering with various um, groups, other health agencies, um, researchers, academics, to try to get some answers to some of these questions and try to get a better understanding ourselves of what the impacts were and, and how to better um, assess and monitor these. So um, we've developed a number of resources, uh, again, most, almost always in collaboration with various other partners. And so these are all available on our website. If you, the easiest way to find it is to Google resource development and Northern Health um, to find the website. Uh, and so we don't have time to talk about all of these today, uh, but we, 
there, there's going to be two that, that Melissa is going to expand on uh, more. One thing I just want to mention is that, you know, we did look at uh, pre-reviewed literature, gray literature, but we also uh, engaged with community representatives to really learn and hear about the lived experiences as well. So I'm just going to pass this over to Melissa now, who's going to talk about two our uh, documents and, and projects that we worked on that really looked more at those social health impacts, leading promising practices, and as well as indicators. Thanks, Barb. Yeah, so next slide when you have a chance. So the first project I'm going to talk about was a collaboration with a number of partners in BC, including the BC Observatory for Population and Public Health. Uh, the various health agencies and authorities of BC as well. So in 2016, we were very fortunate that the BC Observatory was able to secure some funding to conduct a literature scan on what the impacts are to communities associated with resource development, specifically looking at social determinants of health. So a consultant was hired to review gray and peer-reviewed articles and identify what are the impacts in rural and remote contexts and what are some measures and processes we can use to assess and monitor these. So it wasn't intended to be an exhaustive or systematic review, but it was based on a small budget that we'd received to, to start to respond to our evidence gaps in this area and support our work. So for phase one, the consultant, uh, Dr. Laura Lee, produced a really great and comprehensive report, which was quite lengthy and contained quite a bit of academic theory, which really speaks to the complexity of these issues. And it contained a lot of useful information. And we realized that a condensed version would likely be a helpful resource for communities and others participating in environmental assessments and other impact assessment processes. And would also help to address many of the questions we were being asked at the time. So I was contracted by Northern Health and the Observatory to lead the development of a condensed report intended to be a resource for communities, industry proponents, and decision makers uh, here in BC. So I was super lucky to have a very knowledgeable group of people help with this project, including my colleagues at Northern Health, the BC Observatory, the Regional Health Authorities, the First Nations Health Authority, and others at the BC Center for Disease Control. And given that our intended audience is outside of the typical public health world, we included some background information on population health, such as what are the determinants of health and what is equity, as well as a bit of background on impact assessment processes in Canada. The next slide. Uh, so there's a wide variety of pathways by which social determinants can be impacted, and we found these can be very direct, but also complex and indirect. And they can be both positive and negative, and often occur concurrently. These impacts are not experienced uniformly by populations, and individuals and communities can be affected in very diverse ways. But overall, the body of evidence identified Cumulative adverse social impacts occurring across rural and remote Canada, as well as around the world, that are contributing to health inequities. And this included a wide range of social impacts, which were really difficult to categorize uh, because they were so interconnected, but we themed them into the following 15 broad categories. So that includes employment, income and inequities, economic activities, working conditions, food security, housing and the cost of living, pressures on the healthcare system, education, important connections to the land and water, cultural practices and connections to culture, life control, self-determination and self-governance, social connection, connectedness and social support networks, uh, mental health, substance use and family relationships, community safety and crime, sexual health, sex work and sex trafficking, and gender relations and gender-related impacts. So it was interesting, these impacts really reflected the stories and concerns that were being raised by communities across Northern BC. And it was really interesting to see similar impacts occurring in other places, in Canada and around the world. 
Uh, so next slide. So it's clear that predicting and measuring social determinant impacts is complex and challenging. Uh, these impacts occur differently in different contexts depending on existing strengths and vulnerabilities and other contextual factors such as colonialism and boom-bust cycles of development. And as a result, we could not identify a one-size-fits-all approach or generalized list of indicators that could be used to assess these impacts. But we did find numerous frameworks, tools, processes, and guidance documents available to support the work, this work. And you'll see a few examples provided on the slide, but there are many other resources available. While it was exciting to see all the work that's being done on this around the world, there are still many unknowns and data gaps. And we identified that there are lots of opportunities for further work to better understand these impacts and also to develop clear and practical guidelines for BC and Canada and enable us to prevent and manage these impacts and also maximize the positives that development can bring and better support our communities as they grapple with these challenges. Uh, next slide. So this is an example of some of the ways that social determinants can be affected by resource development and extraction projects. Uh, it's really a simplistic drawing, but shows a few examples of the kinds of linkages and hopefully will give you a sense of the ways that health can be affected, the way these factors interact to influence health outcomes. So for example, we might see a large project move into a community and bring jobs, contributing to the financial security of families and individuals. It might also provide opportunities for training and skill development. All of this might result in less poverty and stress and ultimately contribute to positive health outcomes. These jobs might require workers to work for many consecutive weeks in isolated camp environments away from their families and home communities. And there's evidence that this can result in stress and social isolation and potentially contribute to things like problematic substance use and family violence, just a few examples, uh, all contributing to negative health outcomes. The project may also bring with it a large workforce from outside the region, resulting in increases to the cost of living, which can contribute to stress, increased homelessness, and the displacement of vulnerable groups, and poverty, all contributing to negative health outcomes, and again, pathways such as substance use and family violence. And projects can also contribute funding to communities, which can then be invested in community facilities and programs, and increase social capital and things like recreational opportunities for residents, ultimately leading to positive health outcomes. So again, these are just a few examples, not meant to be an exhaustive slide. Uh, next slide. So on the flip side, there are also many implications for a community when a project leaves town. Uh, so this can result in high numbers of job losses and unemployment, increased stress and poverty and pathways to substance use, family violence, for example, uh, and negative health outcomes. It can also result in reduced community investments and the, out the out-migration of residents can result in the closure of facilities and services available to those residents who remain in the community. There can also be positive implications for communities during this phase. For instance, with workforces leaving town, the cost of living may go down, increasing the avail availability of affordable housing and contributing to positive health outcomes. So again, these are very simplistic figures, but hopefully provide a few examples of the range of ways communities can be affected. Uh, these rapid boom and bust cycles can place strains on communities. And we usually see that project assessments assess effects associated with operations, but it's rare that the social effects associated with project closures are also considered. So through our literature scan, we identified a number of key leading practices for assessing and monitoring these impacts. Uh, next slide. 
So firstly, the importance of ensuring the meaningful engagement and participation of affected communities throughout the process and in incorporating local and traditional knowledge. Also capturing both positive and negative impacts. Conducting a robust baseline assessment that reflects the regional context over time. Considering equity and how vulnerable populations, different genders and life stages can be affected by a project. Using standardized indicators to support comparisons across populations and also indicators that reflect what is important and relevant to specific communities and subpopulations. Also considering indigenous rights and title, as well as human rights, recognizing affected community members as human rights holders and ensuring those rights are respected. Uh, applying principles of free, prior, and informed consent, as well as ownership, control, access, and possession principles, including recognizing self-determination as a health determinant. Also recognizing colonialism, colonization, and past and present harms affecting Indigenous communities, and reflecting the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Considering the needs of future generations and applying principles of sustainable development. Incorporating a combination of quantitative and qualitative information that's collected at the community level and finally, including iterative mechanisms to assess and respond to emerging impacts and changing conditions as the project goes through its life cycle. Uh, next slide. So I'll talk briefly about a follow-up project that we did. So we received a small seed grant to dive a bit more into indicators for assessing and monitoring socioeconomic and health impacts. This was done in partnership with researchers from the Cumulative Impacts Research Consortium at the University of Northern British Columbia, and again, the BC Observatory for Population and Public Health. So a sample of environmental assessment documents for selected projects in the Northern Health region were reviewed, as well as some grade literature from the Northern BC region uh, to look at the kinds of indicators in general, we found considerable variability in the indicators used in different EAs and also in the indicators proposed in the supporting literature. We found generally limited transparency and clarity on how indicators were selected and overall a strong reliance on desktop reviews of data, as well as a reliance on quantitative publicly available data. We found there were some limitations in the available data as well as in the granularity of the data to individual communities and subpopulations, as well as in the frequency within which the data is collected. And it was identified that community values, experiences, and impacts may not be captured within these broader data sets. Uh, and it was determined that qualitative and community-specific monitoring processes could be better utilized to reflect these nuances and address limitations in available data. So this was an exploratory project with a fairly small sample of EAs reviewed in our region, but it did identify many areas for future work. So one is to develop clear guidelines and criteria for identifying indicators, also to provide guidance on robust community engagement processes and social science methodologies uh, for identifying, measuring, and monitoring these impacts, and to support the collection of primary data at the community level. Also to consider a parallel streams monitoring approach that uses a combination of publicly accessible standardized data, as well as community-driven and derived data. In addition, more work can be done to address gaps in the available surveillance data including improving the granularity and frequency of data collection to support efforts to monitor these impacts and further improve our understanding of how local communities are affected. So next slide, and back over to you, Barb. Okay, thank you, and sorry for the delay in slides. It seems like it takes my computer a minute to wake up. Um, but yeah, I just uh, wanted to take some time now to just reflect on how we're 
trying to implement some of the learnings from these documents as well as other work that we've done into our practice. Um, we do a lot of work at the project level in our office, uh, especially most of the work we do at the project level is supporting the environmental assessment process, the, the BC environmental assessment process um, as a working group member. So for those that are familiar with the BC process, it, it doesn't just look at environmental impact, but also looks at uh, impacts to social, uh, economic, heritage and health impacts. And so we try to participate in that process across the Northern Health region as a working group member. And so we try to really, um, the leading practices that, we, that we've learned and become familiar with and, and the information that we gather from, from this work that we've been doing, try to really um, have that reflected in the review comments that we provide and the conversations and the meeting um, comments that we make uh, when we meet with proponents and with the Environmental Assessment Office. Um, so what we try to do really is at the project level is, is be, um, engage early in that process when uh, I think it used, it used to be called the application information requirement. I think it's now called the environmental assessment plan. So when that's being developed and when uh, decisions are being made of how the assessment is gonna be done, we try to incorporate these leading practices into, into the process. Um, but even throughout the process, uh, when we provide comments on our, the application review, for instance, or um, the environmental assessment report that goes to decision makers, or um, when conditions are being drafted and um, refined, we try to make sure that um, those leading practices are, are being reflected in that. Uh, the other thing that we try to do is to work, take a health and all policies approach and participate in various um, policy initiatives at the various government levels. So at the local level, um, we provide comments um, on, on official community plans and other, um, say, rezoning or temporary land, uh, temporary use permit um, uh, planning decisions. And so, of course, again, because the communities in the Northern Health regions are so closely tied to the resource sector, usually there are already sections in official community plans that talk about industry and resource development. So we, again, try to bring in some of those leading practices and some things that communities should consider um, into those, um, those planning documents. Uh, very similar at the provincial and federal level. At the provincial level, we've been very fortunate to have been asked to participate in, in the development of, of a number of guidance documents or um, work that's been happening around um, social impacts related to industrial camps, for instance. And so we've been able to, um, again, participate in those processes and, and share what we know and uh, about health and how health is determined. Uh, as part of that. And then um, at the federal level as well, for instance, the environmental assessment review, um, the, the federal sustainability strategy, they all provided opportunities for, for public comment. And so we provided comments as part of those initiatives. And uh, the other thing um, that we do is in addition to supporting research, we also feel like we're at the position now where you know we, we have learned quite a bit over the last few years so we're trying to share these learnings more broadly to um, community representatives um, agency decision makers um, those that are um, you know industry decision makers those that are can in influence change and better incorporate health into practice and so we um, for example today presenting to different groups to try to share what, what we know and, and what we've learned. Um, but we've also been doing some more um, targeted work on knowledge translation together with the Environment, Community and Health Observatory Network, so the ECHO Network, which is a five-year research project that's focused on strengthening intersectoral capacity to understand and respond to health impacts of resource development across the environment, community and health sectors. Uh, it's comprised of four uh, regional cases across Canada. We are part of the Northern Regional case and as, uh, under that Northern Regional case we've been doing a little bit of uh, knowledge translation work and, and we're just beginning this work but trying to figure out how do we communities communicate these fairly complex um, and very um, you know um, uh, a little a lot of moving parts. How do we uh, communicate these these concepts in easy and simple ways. So I'm just going to share a couple with you now um, that we've figures that we've kind of been playing around with. These are still in draft and we're still, you know, um, they're, not, they're not final and we're still playing around with them, but really trying to um, develop some posters, one pagers, pamphlets, or 
or things that we can share um, that summarize what we've learned. So this figure here is really a, a summary of the impact associated with resource development on health and the determinants of health. So what this tries to show is that industry and resource development can result in environmental changes, social changes, cultural changes, and economic changes, which then can change various aspects of the ecological determinants of health, the social determinants of health, the cultural determinants of health, and the economic determinants of health. And these interact in complex ways to then shape mental health outcomes, injury rates, communicable disease rates, substance use and related harms, sexual health conditions, um, personal health practices, uh, various chronic and acute illnesses, and health equity in community. And so uh, again, these are drafts, so happy to hear if there's anybody on the line here that has any thoughts or perspectives or expertise and knowledge uh, translation, happy to have any kind of feedback on these. But this is really the figure that, that summarizes, tries to simplify a fairly complex concept around the, the impact. The other figure that we've been working on is one that summarizes the leading principles and promising practices for the assessment and monitoring. So these should sound fairly familiar um, because they really, a lot of them are very similar to what Melissa has um, just summarized, but maybe captured a little bit differently. So what this is trying to illustrate is that in order to properly assess health impacts associated with resource development, um, it requires meaningful communication, uh, meaningful community participation. You need to consider a broad range of health determinants, uh, incorporate local and traditional knowledge, develop a comprehensive baseline, consider both positive and negative impacts of projects, um, consider quantitative information, but also qualitative information, consider equity and differential impacts um, within and between populations, including things like gendered impact, um, consider standardized values that can be compared across projects over time, but also have that supplemented by local values and indicators that very much capture the uniqueness in community. Um, consider ethics, including free prior and informed consent and uh, the OCAP uh, ownership control access and possession principles. Uh, consider indigenous rights and human rights. Uh, assess cumulative impacts, contextual impacts, and intergenerational impacts. And it should really be a system of ongoing evaluation so that um, it's not a one-time assessment, that, but there's um, monitoring, monitoring that happens throughout the life of the project that the findings of which can then be incorporated into adaptive management. And then this is the last figure um, that mostly it's been was developed by, by UMBC, but it just summarizes the different uh, impact assessment families and protocols of uh, recognizing that the assessment families that are usually used to assess Im health impacts are uh, fall under environmental impact assessment, social impact assessment, and health impact assessments, but that there's various example protocols under each. So now I just want to take the last few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the successes that we've seen at the Office of Health and Resource Development over the last a uh, few years since the office began. Um, definitely, and this is mostly just based on our own observations, our own experiences. It's not um, supported by any you know, hard data or anything like that. But overall, I do uh, think that the way that health is being incorporated into environmental assessments in the Northern Health Region has incre uh, improved since we um, first started participating in 2014. Uh, overall, you know, we are seeing an increased recognition of these issues by industry and agencies and decision makers, and which has been really nice to see. I think part of it is the result of us being at the table and having had some dedicated resources to be able to um, provide consistent messaging and really um, try to uh, um, incorporate some of the leading practices into the ways that um, these these assessments have been done. But of course, we fully recognize that we are only one of, of many uh, voices and many um, people that are that are working in this area. And that we're really, um, you know, there, there's, there's many groups that have been doing a lot of work in this area that's helped to contribute to this um, advancement. I would say, especially a lot of the Indigenous representatives have been doing a lot of heavy lifting to uh, result in better incorporation of health and wellness into these project decisions. Overall, uh, I would say that um, 
we are starting to see the themes that we've been advocating for um, increasingly being incorporated into policy or draft policy, which is really fantastic to see. And again, not just because of the work that we've been doing, but the work of, of many. Um, and it's, but it has been really great and rewarding to see some of our work, um, including the report that Melissa summarized, being referenced in things like discussion papers that are going to ministers or draft guidance documents and things like that. So that's been really fantastic. Uh, overall, we've also developed a strong agency and research partnerships and collaborations. It's been um, really fantastic working with other partners in this area and you know we're, we're often now recognized as a partner at the table and as a player and so that's been um, definitely a change over the last 10 years um, comparing where Northern Health was 10 years ago to where we are today. Of course um, successes always come with have associated with challenges and um, while you know we've seen improvements um, we there's, there's still lots of room for, for further improvement. Uh, somebody that I work closely with has once compared this to you know, trying to change the direction of a very slow moving ship. It's, it's very slow and steady, um, which is a bit unfortunate because I know at, some, at one point, um, Canada and BC were once global leaders in health impact assessment and, and we are um, no longer. And so I think overall, there is still a limited understanding of impact to the social, cultural, and economic determinants of health, um, especially amongst those outside of the health um, agencies. And I think part of that is that social impacts are quite complex. They affect individuals and communities in diverse ways. It's not something that's easily done off the side of somebody's desk. It requires a certain amount of expertise, uh, education, experience, and ability to work across sectors, which of course takes time and capacity, which is always in short um, supply. Uh, not only for different agencies and individuals working on these projects, but also for industry who are competing on you know, international scale. Um, we are still seeing a large variability of practice where you know, sometimes we see proponents that are doing a really great job of incorporating health and the broader um, uh, definitions and leading practices related to health. Uh, but there's also uh, many that are also doing the minimal requirements. And I think that's one of the concerns is that there, right now in BC, there's really no um, strong guidance or directive that aligns with the leading practices, um, which, which is you know, allowing this big variability in practice. And the other thing that we've identified ourselves, again, is that um, what currently seems to me missing is uh, there's no professional body that regulates or oversees health or in social impact assessors in BC. So unlike professional engineers or professional biologists, professional foresters that have a regulatory body that ensures that the quality uh, qualifications and ethics from that, for that profession are being managed. Um, so if you, you know, we hire a professional biologist, you are, are assured that there's a certain quality of work associated with that. Um, that same is not true for social health impact assessors. Anybody really can do the work, which again adds that variability in practice. Um, and overall, of course, um, this is all in the backdrop of complex political climates where, uh, you know, these projects, there's a lot at stake for everybody, lots of jobs, lots of money, lots of impact. Um, it's, it's really, um, you know, I, I sometimes joke that if, if you want to see communities, a community at odds with each other, you can propose a major project because there's lots of divergent views about that. And I think that makes the, the whole thing challenging as well. Um, for next steps, I think for us, like we're going to keep doing the work that we're doing, working at both the project level and also focusing on education, awareness, research and um, health and all policies. One of the things, in addition to some of the KT work that we're doing under the ECHO network uh, that I thought I would mention is we are starting a research project under the Northern Regional case that is going to be looking at some learnings that we can take from other organizations that are working across environment, community, and health um, sectors and, uh, um, to get some uh, learnings around the challenges and successes from those organizations. We're also, of course, very excited about some of the opportunities under the new BCEA revitalization pro uh, process and the uh, potential federal changes uh, to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. And so we're very much looking forward to some of the opportunities that that can provide. And uh, like Melissa mentioned, there's still a lot of work to do um, and, and 
again, we're a very small office. We we're, we know we, we can't do it alone. So really uh, look forward to working with others, um, influencers, policymakers, researchers, health and knowledge translation organizations, but also industry that's been um, implementing some of these leading practices to really be able to advance this work and hopefully be able to be a global leader once again in how health is being considered in major project decisions. That's really it for me, but happy to take any questions from, from anybody. Thank you so much, Barb and Melissa. So we'll go to questions now. Any questions in the room? Probably I'll jump in. Uh, I'm Drona uh, Rosali, uh, Director of Population Health Surveillance and Epidemiology at BCCDC, Population and Public Health. Uh, thank you, Barb and Melissa, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, it's great to see that the work uh, we did in collaboration uh, with your team uh, and uh, Northern Health uh, UNBC. Uh, uh, you, are, you are planning out uh, and you are taking on for the next steps uh, in terms of knowledge translation, creating awareness and advocacy on the <coughs> determinant, social determinants of health. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, if there is anything in the next step uh, you are willing to collaborate with us, uh, we are still open and uh, uh, we are happy to help out anything we can do. That's all I want to comment on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Drona. That's really nice. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch for sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, I have a question for Melissa. That uh, one slide, I don't know what number of that slide was that you showed that um, when the project is leaving, then definitely people are leaving and then the house is becoming cheaper. So, and then the positive impact of the same slide you showed that when project is leaving, people are losing the job, so negative impact. So how this both at the same time positive impact, yeah, this, this is the slide. So the demographic change, reduce of cost of living, affordable housing, so positive change. Then again, lost job and unemployment, poverty, and then those uh, drug plus negative outcomes. So how these two will go side by side or how you will combine them or what is your objective to go from there? Sorry, I think I'm still muted. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really great question and definitely something we're still grappling with. Um, it's clear like different individuals uh, within a community are affected quite differently and sometimes positively and, and as you said, negatively at the same time. So I think our general approach is to try and be balanced and, and to promote the positive where we can and then try to minimize and work with, with others and communities to try and minimize some of the the negative um, uh, impacts. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of just where we are at, and I don't really have a, a clear answer. Maybe I'll just add to that as well. And I think that was part of what we were trying to show in these figures is that the, the impacts are quite complex and they can affect, you can have both positive and negative things happening at the same time. Um, so for instance, even when a project comes to town, what you can have is those people that can secure a job and make the good wages, you know, their um, incomes increase and they're, they're, they have less stress related to finances. Uh, but the same, there's people that aren't able to secure those higher paying jobs and for them things become more expensive. And you know the cost of living, the cost of food gets more expensive and they can actually lead to poverty. And the same is true when a project leaves town that you know, those that lose their jobs um, for them, you know, they have they face more financial hardships. But there's also those people that work at, you know, not at the mine or not at the, you know, facility, but are working in other areas in town, and so they don't lose their jobs. And for them, things become more affordable. So you're seeing these impacts happening at the same time, and that's why they are really complex sometimes to be able to quantify and to be able to fully understand, and then to be able to manage as well. Thanks for the question. That's really yeah. great. Yeah, so other, if I kind of change the question in another way that would there be any government assisted program so that will subsidize or somehow will try to make a balance even if the project leaves, infrastructure will be there so people will have some sorts of opportunity to do the work so the community will be totally not diminished because of the project only thing. So. 
Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's definitely some of the comments we make is that when you're looking at impacts for project, you need to consider both the boom, but also the bust. And there should be some things in place, financial management strategy, transitioning um, strategies, work at the community level. So to create um, resilience in the community to be able to, um, you know, be okay when the project leaves. And I know there is a researcher at UMBC that under the, the well, the Community Development Institute at UMBC, they do a lot of work around this piece of, um, um, resilience at the community level in boom bust communities and, and you know things that should be in place to be able to be able to uh, sorry better weather these ups and downs in the economic swings but often we see that it, you know it, it's not perfect and and we don't always see that pre-planning so we we have seen definitely communities that have been heavily impacted by uh, job closures or um, certain industries closing and leaving town Thank you. Any other questions? Just speak up a little bit. Hi, Barb. Hi, Melissa. This is Shira Freeman from NCCEH speaking. Um, I, a I, w I wanted to ask you a question about um, two things that you raised. One was the um, the need for kind of cross-sectoral collaboration and engagement in uh, identifying the different impacts, and also the need for some kind of regulation requiring that those impacts be considered uh, within assessment frameworks. And can you just comment on, you've done a lot of relation, obvious relationship building that has led to this kind of that addresses the cross-sectoral part the, or the collaboration part. And I'm interested in how the need for firm regulation requiring uh, the impacts to be considered in decision-making versus the relationship building uh, weighs in, in your successes. Right, I, I mean, and, and again, we, we don't have all the answers, but just from opinions, um, you know, I, I think you need both. Uh, you need to be able to have those relationships across sectors, even just so you can understand each other. So I, I come actually from the environmental sector and I was new to health and there's just even some of the language, like the use of upstream, for instance, if you're working in oil and gas versus if you're working in health, upstream means something very differently. And so being able to really learn to understand each other and, and work together and be able to look at things from each other's viewpoints, I think is really important and, and having those partnerships is super important. But I, definitely from our experiences, regulations speak volumes. Um, many companies, like that's their number one, we have to make sure we're not breaking the law. We have to make sure we're following the regulations. And that's really the number one driver that drives their project and, and their approvals because um, you know, they're responsible to their shareholders, they're competitive on a global market. So um, some will go beyond for, for various reasons, beyond the regulatory requirements, but at the same time, that really is the main thing that will um, determine how, um, you know, uh, how our project is, is developed and the decisions that are made, again, based on the experiences and observations that, that we've made. I don't know if that answered your question. Hopefully it did. I would just follow on with how important is change in regulation um, in in terms of promoting the inclusion of health impacts. Yeah, I mean, I think under the current regulation, there is ways to improve the way that health are being considered, and some of it's already been done. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the the current process um, well and and I can't to be honest I can't speak much about the new provincial environmental process because I think a lot of the processes and regulations are still to be developed and they you know they it's still wait to be seen of how that all applies but definitely under the old environmental assessment process the process was very much focused on environmental and developed from an environmental perspective and so there's things around like things like thresholds or looking at just adverse impacts that really limits how well health can be looked at under that um, those 
those regulations. And so ideally, what I would love to see is actual regulations that require health impact assessments in addition to environmental assessments. But, uh, um, you know, of course, that's, you know, that's what I'd like to see but in, in a perfect world. Thank you. Thanks, Barb and Melissa. So we have um, a few, a couple questions in a chat box. So thanks for those of you who've shared resources in the chat box. Um, so Diana and Melissa shared links to the ECHO network and their resources, um, and a summary of uh, work to date at the ECHO network. And Lydia shared a blog post on the NCCH website related to today's webinar. Um, and so we have a question from Diane. Um, can you comment on the intersection of the impacts of resource extraction on COH and climate change? Um, sorry, I'm just going to find the comment just so I make sure I'm answering it right. The third one's on the bottom. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, when we, of course, when you add climate change to the whole thing, which of course is very much driven by um, industrial activity, but also consumers, of course, uh, it, it, it complicates everything because we know that climate change really affects all of the determinants of health or, or most of the determinants of health and we'll just add another lens to all of these complexities. So I think um, it's something that definitely we, we need to um, keep in our view and it's something that we've been trying to again incorporate in our comments at the environmental assessment level to consider climate change impacts not only on the environment but also what does that mean for health around things like food security things like poverty things like housing things like flooding fires uh, you know all, all sorts of things so I, I mean I think you could probably do a whole presentation on that topic well we can we could have a whole um, conference on that topic and and I'm we're not necessarily, well, we're not the experts in, in that area, but it's definitely something that we're aware of, and we do try to bring that into the conversation as well. But thank you for pointing that out for sure. Thanks for that. Um, so there's a comment from Candace, who works with Dr. Janice Chandro. Um, I believe she is at UVic. Uh, she shared a link to their work on um, HIA and working with First Nations. So if you're interested, feel free to take a look. Um, and I think that's the questions. If you, if anybody has more comments or questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. Um, any other questions from in the room? And um, Melissa and Barb, if you want to comment on any of the comments that just came in in the chat box from Candace or Diane, um, feel free to do so. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Candace, for sharing that. I. I've certainly um, read some some of that work, and and really, it's informed our our comments and our thinking, and and really appreciate that that's going on. So, hope to keep keep updated on what you guys are doing. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions that we have time for today. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to to I can't remember, did Barb and Melissa, did you share your email addresses? I believe you did. If not, um, feel free to email them to me and I will pass them on to Barb and Melissa. So thank you everyone and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.